Hello everyone and welcome to Arizona Wildlife Views. I'm Andy Clark, Aquatic Wildlife Assistant Branch Chief for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Today, you'll meet one of my amazing young colleagues working on a team trying to recover one of Arizona's most endangered fish species. And later, a look at how Arizona Game and Fish is giving Valley teachers a field trip opportunity to see some incredible wildlife. Plus, we continue our fishing lessons with Cinda Howard, this time mastering the art of lake fishing. We've got all this and more starting right now on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. Today we'll introduce you to Polar Walters, a biologist with the department that's working to bring back one of Arizona's endangered fish species, the Razorback Sucker. I think you'll see her enthusiasm for this project is infectious. They do look so good. In her Flagstaff laboratory, Arizona Game and Fish research biologist Pilar Walters is checking on her babies. After they hatch, they just kind of wiggle around in the bottom of the container until they're ready to swim up. These newly hatched fish are native to the Colorado River, but they got their start in a lab run by the USGS. Oh yes, look at the eggs. Oh, you guys, this is amazing. This is where Pilar combined eggs and sperm from adult fish to spawn razorback suckers, flannel mouth suckers, and combinations of both. By making hybrids, she's hoping to learn a thing or two about how they might affect the future of the endangered razorback sucker. So this is a razorback sucker. You can see this nuchal keel right behind its head. So the the purpose of this study is to understand how hybridization with flannel mouth sucker could impact the recovery of wild razorback suckers. Pilar gets her adult razorbacks from the Nevada Department of Wildlife and its lake meat hatchery. The flannel mouths are from the confluence of the Perea and Colorado rivers. This is Lee's Ferry. It's the start of rafting trips through the Grand Canyon and fishing trips on the Colorado River. Just downstream is where the murky, sediment-laden Perea River spills into the crystal clear waters of the mighty Colorado. I wanted to show you what this place looks like in the daylight because Pilar does her work here in the dark. Hopefully we get them. This is where we got them last year. We've been out a couple other times where we didn't catch any. A lot of other scientists have come in here to study the flannel mouth suckers spawning in the Perea. So, I'm not the first. Um, in fact, they told me how to come in here and catch them, but then I, I refined it to the nighttime and it seems to be a lot more effective, so. Seining into gale force winds. With help from her intern, Marshall, Pilar drags a seine through the water and hopes for the best. We've got fish, you guys. Yes. Yeah. Look at these babies. Oh, yeah. This is exactly what I'm looking for. This is a flannel mouth sucker. Yeah. Oh, man. That's amazing. See? See what I mean? Just one pull. They're there. <laughs> now, what we have to do is process them. Karina is a volunteer, and since it's her first time on this project, she's in for an initiation of sorts. OK, time to kiss a fish. <laughs> With the fish kissing out of the way, it's time to get down to business. Hey, flannel mouth sucker. Male ripe. Pilar measures every fish and decides which ones she's going to keep. Four, seven, eight. We're taking him. She's looking for fertile fish that are almost ready to spawn. Four, seven, zero. She's got lots of good eggs in there. 
fish that aren't quite there get a microchip unless they have one from a previous capture. Pit tag recapture, no. Getting a new pit tag. Then those non-keepers are released. I am absolutely very happy with the outcome today. I have selected a few spawning fish to take back to the lab so I can then spawn them in our Razorback Sucker, Flatamel Sucker hybridization study. We're taking 16. I hope that they stay happy enough to spawn. The Razorback Sucker was listed as an endangered species in 1991. Its decline has been linked to changes in habitat after dams were built on the Colorado River, as well as competition and predation from non-native sport fish. The Razorback Suckers are spawning in the wild, but we're seeing very limited recruitment, so their larvae aren't growing up to become adults as readily as like the flannel mouth sucker. Lake Mead is special because it's known to have a small self-sustaining population of wild razorbacks. Other wild populations require regular stocking because their offspring rarely survive to adulthood. We know that these wild razorbacks are hybridizing naturally with the flannel mouth sucker. What's not known is how hybridization will affect razorbacks in the long run. We could have the loss of that lake mead razorback sucker population through hybridization, but we don't know what the chances of that are because we didn't know anything about the viability, the early life stage viability of these hybrids prior to this project. Oh yeah, so see them running down our tail there? It's a five-year research project funded by the Bureau of Reclamation. The work we are doing is not gonna stop hybridization, but we're trying to learn more about the impacts hybridization could have on the recovery of wild razorback suckers. After getting her fish to spawn, Pilar takes awesome. the fertilized eggs back to her lab. Bring those guys up to temperature. And places them yes. into homemade hatching jars. A moment of truth. I made the jars out of bottles that I had my dad save me. And in them, she's raising four flavors of fish for her study. So we have razorback sucker, flannel mouth sucker, razor mouth sucker, which is the razorback female crossed with the flannel mouth male hybrid. And we have flannel back sucker, which is the flannel mouth female crossed with razorback male. It is a lot to keep track of, yeah. So I have to make sure I explicitly label everything. Flannel mouth sucker. Pilar started this study in 2016 as a graduate student at Northern Arizona University. I attempted to answer the question of the hatching success and the larval survival. She discovered that hybrids seem to hatch and survive at rates similar to their parent species. My uh, second chapter of my thesis was actually looking at the shape of these fish. So. Uh, when we're out sampling areas of the Colorado River that have razorback suckers and flannel mouth suckers, we're finding what appear to be hybrids. They, they look essentially like a razorback wearing a flannel mouth sucker suit. Pilar discovered that it's nearly impossible to identify hybrids by shape when they're smaller than about six inches. What we don't want is we don't want to find a whole bunch of hybrids that have keels this big and call them razorback suckers because that's that's a big deal uh, because now this endangered species is all of a sudden um, recruiting in an area that we haven't seen recruitment yet. However, it's not necessarily true because they were hybrids. What I ultimately want to do is I want to be able to inform the, the field biologists that are working with these animals in the wild to say, hey, these are working with these animals and can identify these fish. 2018 is the third year of the project, and Pilar will soon put the fish she spawned through swim trials in moving water to try to determine if hybrids prefer a river or lake environment. We're also kind of interested in competition and um, growth between razorback suckers, flannel mouth suckers, and their hybrids. On the river, larval razorback suckers rarely survive to maturity. One theory is that hybrids and flannel mouths might be outcompeting young razorbacks for food. Pilar will test that theory with a feeding experiment to see if it holds true. The eggs have all hatched. We have some fish trying to swim up today. 
Spend just a little bit of time around Pilar and it becomes obvious she's a biologist who really loves her job. <laughs> yeah. I do, it's really lucky I do too because I had to put in a lot of work. So I, my master's, I was a full-time student and still full-time game and fish. And it was just a lot of work. <laughs> it would have been really hard if I didn't love this. The research that I do is to inform managers. So like the Fish and Wildlife Service makes species, you know, designations as endangered or they, you know, could downlist to threatened or whatever. Um, we have two native species together, one of which is endangered and one is actually doing really well. Um, what do we do? Is, is the hybrid protected? Is it, you know, how do, we, how do we manage these things? Those are some big questions, and these tanks might hold some of the answers that can help wildlife managers make good decisions for the future of the endangered razorback sucker. Hi, I'm Cinda Howard with Fly Fish Arizona and Beyond. I'm a guide and instructor here in the White Mountains, and today we are on Big Lake, and we're going to teach you how to fish a lake with a fly rod. We couldn't have asked for a prettier day. When you're out fly fishing, you don't think about anything else. You're out with nature, you're forgetting your problems, and it's beautiful. You know, I always say trout do not live in ugly places. Coming in today, saw so many animals and wildlife, and it's just spectacular. This is Jules. She's a good fishing buddy. She likes to lick the fish. So we are at Big Lake, which is on the Apache Sig Greaves Forest Service. We just launched out of Railroad Cove, and uh, we are on the hunt for some cutthroat today and probably some rainbows. When I look at this lake, it is vast, and a lot of people come to Big Lake and they just don't know where to start. So what I'm looking for is I just want to cover a cove. So I'm going to pick a cove that I decide I want to fish, and I'm going to start shallow and then I'm gonna work my way deeper if we have to. I'm gonna take my pair of forceps and I'm going to clamp them on my bottom fly. And I'm just gonna drop them in the lake. Some people freak out over that. <laughs> so this is how I tell how deep I am. When they hit the bottom, I know that's my depth. So if you see where my indicator is, my indicator is actually a little too high on my line because we don't want our flies laying on the bottom, but we want this indicator to suspend them just a few inches above the bottom of the lake. We don't see a lot of fish surfacing, so we won't fish on top. So we're just gonna cast out. If you notice, I'm casting towards the end of the lake, which would be towards the weed beds. And so these fish will cruise in and out of the weeds eating bugs because that's the majority of a trout's diet is bug life. I have two flies on. My first fly is a size 18 black and copper zebra midge. This is a go-to fly for me in lakes when I'm going to use a strike indicator and try to suspend some midges underneath the surface. And then I have a small, about a size 12 white woolly bugger. Now this fly may just work as an attractor. A lot of times the fish will see the brighter fly or the bigger fly, that will attract them, but then they'll eat the fly that looks a little bit more natural. So a lot of times on my top fly, it's a little bigger, it's a little brighter, it's something that's gonna catch their attention and then they'll go, whoa, look at that one under it because it looks more natural and that's the one they'll eat. Um, about a foot up the line, I am fishing a size four split shot. And then above that is my strike indicator, which is what we'll be paying attention to. I'm going to watch this indicator, and if it moves on, I'm going to set the hook. We're just going to lift. We're going to lift enough to pull all the slack out and hook the fish. And, um, you know, the way it is is it's just a straight lift. You know, but this is a lot of just watching that indicator and seeing if it moves weird or goes under, anything strange happens, that's potentially our fish. I give it a little bit of bump, um, meaning a kind of a twitch. That twitch sometimes will initiate that strike. Sometimes when that bug just kind of does a little twitch in the water, that's what it takes to that fish to go, oh, that's something real, I think I'm gonna eat that. And so it just kind of gets them to 
have that little predatory instinct and, and eat that fly. So it's just letting the wind take it and twitching it every once in a while. So the first thing that I do when I'm not catching fish is I just change flies rather than changing depth. And this fly is called a semi-seal leech. It's uh, the blood leech color. That's fish. All right, got one on. So when I find this fish, I'm keeping my rod tip all the way pointed at the sky. I want this rod to absorb all the pressure of the fish. And let's see if we can get it around this oar. Get him in the net. And it's one of the beautiful cutthroat that Arizona Game and Fish put in this lake. We'll throw our flies back out. We'll give him a little drink of water. Always wet your hands before you hold a fish so you don't absorb their protective coating. There's a beauty. And how you tell it's a cutthroat, you see that little orange cut under his under his mouth, under his lip. That's your cutthroat marking. All right, now we just give him a drink of water. Let him swim off. We're gonna change up the way we're fishing just to demonstrate a different way to catch fish when you're fly fishing, especially in a lake like this. And we just caught that beautiful cutthroat on this uh, blood leech color semi seal leech. So I put it back on. We're gonna cast out. And now I'm just gonna let the fly sink. And I'm gonna start with a 10 second count. You know, I want my fly to sink down, but if I catch a fish, I wanna know how deep I was when I caught it. So that 10 count, uh, if I were to catch a fish, that's where I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna keep counting to 10 every time I cast. If I don't catch a fish on the 10 count, I'll go to a 15 count. So when I cast the fly out, I've let it sink. Important things when we move a fly through the water is now I'm going based off of fill. A moment ago, we were watching a strike indicator. Now I'm going to feel the hit. So I want my rod tip all the way down in the water. And I'm just stripping this fly through the line through my hand. Now we do things like we vary our strips. Some fish want it fast, sometimes they want it slow. And so I usually start with a a medium speed strip, right? It's a strip strip. I pause, strip some more, pause again. There should never be any hesitation between you feeling the fish and you setting the hook. The same with the strike indicator. As soon as you see that thing move, you want to set the hook because as soon as that fish realizes I've just made a huge mistake, it's going to spit it out. We have hundreds of trout legs and then if you start talking about bluegill love D to fly and bass love D to fly there's so much you can do with a fly rod in Arizona. On a sunny April morning more than a dozen teachers from around the valley ventured onto a few boats for a field trip courtesy of Arizona Game and Fish. Today we took some teachers on, on a trip across Lake Pleasant to join our bald eagle biologists as they uh, rappelled down into a nest to place identification bands and take some important data. The outing was part of a new program by Arizona Game and Fish designed specifically for the state's educators. All of this together is part of what we call our Focus Wild Arizona, which is the Arizona Game and Fish Department's wildlife education program, which is allowing us to, to provide the resources and materials and programs for teachers to be able to take wildlife concepts and wildlife issues into the classroom um, so that they can bring those experiences to their students. On this occasion, the teachers are also joined by members of the media and Game and Fish volunteers. After a short hike with some stunning lake views, the group reaches the cliffside location where Game and Fish wildlife biologists begin the process of retrieving a pair of bald eaglets from their nest. As they're sent up the side of the cliff in a canvas bag, the teachers and others eagerly gather round for a closer look. 
the data collection on the eaglets begins, and so do the questions from teachers. Not yet, but I will be able to tell you here shortly. So this leg looks like it's 13.5 millimeters, mm -hmm. so it's likely a girl. Many of the instructors are already thinking about lesson plans and how to implement what they're seeing and learning. Teaching um, fourth grade, we do a lot of animal studies, and right now we're talking about birds, specifically bald eagles, so this just fits in perfectly with my planning for lessons right now. Bringing this experience somehow to my students was just something that I couldn't pass up. Just kind of guide her. Now you can let your hands go. Don't touch her at all. She's at 3.6 kilograms. With cameras and phones rolling, the teachers record some of their up-close and personal experiences for their students back home. By giving the teachers this type of experience, something that they, would, that they can't really experience anywhere else, um, they build a passion for these animals and that passion is what is shown back to the students and, and by, they, they share that passion which can, be, which can help shape the kids and, and get them to enjoy and, and understand and appreciate the wildlife that we're talking about. It makes it a little bit more real for them. If they see the teachers excited about it, then they can get excited about it as well. Arizona Game and Fish believes making these real world wildlife experiences available to instructors will lead to positive changes in the classroom and inspire students to get their parents to take them outdoors to check out wildlife in Arizona for themselves. I know that this year alone, every weekend I get messages from parents like, we're out camping, we're out checking this, my kid wants you to see this picture of this hawk that they saw. So it definitely plays into what my kids do on the weekends too. I think that showing the kids that there's beyond a textbook that there's like real things out there that we need to care about and and how you know the efforts of scientists the efforts of the community the efforts of game and fish to protect animals that were once endangered is something that the kids need to know the teachers really enjoyed it. It was a once in a lifetime experience, um, something that they're able to bring back into the classroom to show their students how science is done in the real world. Hi, my name is Cinda Howard with Fly Fish Arizona and Beyond, and I'm going to show you a dozen flies that if you have in your box that you can catch fish anywhere. You know, fly fishing really is about us replicating what the fish are naturally eating. And we're talking about trout. A majority of a trout's diet is bugs. You know, and with fly fishing, we can replicate anything. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to naturally replicate what these fish are eating. And so there's a few patterns that are tried and true. That no matter where you fish them, there's a good chance that they're going to catch fish. This is a grasshopper pattern. And we fish grasshoppers any time that there's grasshoppers out, which is when the ground's getting warm, those grasshoppers get blown in the water, fish love them, it's a big meal for a fish. And there's something about an ant that fish love. I mean, you'll see fish just pound an ant. This is a caddis. A caddis is a bug that actually hatches from the water. This is a parachute atoms. Now, parachute atoms is what we call an attractor pattern because it looks like several different other flies, but really it looks like a mayfly. PMX when you're just searching for something that works, that PMX would do well. This is a prince nymph. Now it has a bead. It's supposed to sink. Um, this is going to be a subsurface fly. Same thing with that copper jaw, and also a bead head fly is supposed to sink. Next one is the hare's ear, and it's the juvenile of the caddis. Pheasant tail nymph, it looks like a mayfly. Zebra midge, a midge is a little bitty bug that comes off the water. There's a midge in every piece of water that you're ever going to fish. Now, my favorite is this black woolly bugger. If someone said, Cinda, you can only fish one fly for the rest of your life, it would be a black woolly bugger because I feel like I can catch anything on it, whether it's bass or bluegill or trout, and it's a really good pattern to have in your box. Next one is a beadhead semi-seal leech, and it represents a leech pattern, a bait fish. If you don't know where to start, these 12 patterns will catch fish for you. These are good, reliable patterns that you're going to catch fish on. Arizona's chock full of great places to go fishing. Arizona Game and Fish Department makes sure of it. I'm Andy Clark. Until next time, get out there and enjoy those Arizona wildlife views.
to subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, call 1-800-777-0015 or visit www.azgfd.gov magazine.